Hi, uh, thank you so much, Nej. We are really lucky. I'm very lucky to uh, talk to you, not just because you're a doctor, but you are a doctor who is so committed in people welfare. You have you wear a lot of hats, and uh, you are a big advocate uh, when it comes to. Uh, making sure that people look after themselves, their needs have been addressed, uh, and you're so passionate. Um, you don't need a lot of introduction for Queenslanders. We all know you very well here, especially Gold Coast. Uh, I have had actually patients who have actually seen you in Gold Coast University Hospital and come back and tell me, oh, I met this lovely doctor, you know, when you talk to him, you really will uh, fall in love with his personality. He's so beautiful, very gentle uh -huh. and caring. <laughs> and this oh, is Thank you, I'm so touched. That's really nice. Yeah, so for, for those of who, uh, who don't know much about you, I'll give you a little intro. Uh, Dinesh is um, a doctor and a lawyer so he was first actually trained as a lawyer and then he's his passion has led um into taking uh, medicine um from griffith university and now you're working in emergency department as a senior resident yeah that's me and it doesn't end there you are an ambassador for physical disabilities australia um, you are one of the very few people who have actually successfully done a lot for uh, physically challenged people. And that's amazing. I'm really thrilled and I'm super excited to talk to you today, Vinesh. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here too. <laughs> so, you know, I was, um, the first question that I was uh, having in my mind is about you being the frontline doctor in the emergency department of Gold Coast University Hospital. What is it like and how do you evaluate the general measures that has been taken um, so far? And um, what progress have we made to protect the community? Yeah, I think um, this is such a unique and unprecedented situation that we've found ourselves in. So a lot of uh, governments and um, countries are making it up as we go, the best we can. But I guess we can look at um, what's happened to some of the other nations, like the United States has really struggled with this. Um, they have so many cases over there, particularly New York. You hear about how some of our colleagues are doing there, um, struggling to look after their patients, not having enough personal protective equipment. And then you look at what's happening in Italy where they're facing similar challenges and other parts of the world as well. Like the NHS is under um, significant pressure at the moment. So um, compared to those nations, I think that we're doing so, so well. And I think that we're lucky to be here. So the social isolation measures that we've taken, the social restrictions, shutting down everything early and decisively, um, like Australia and New Zealand done, it saved so many lives. And in our nation, we've got, I think, 71 deaths, which is sad, but it's a lot less than what other countries are facing. So compared to what's going on around the world, I think we've done an amazing job. And the effect of that has been um, lessening the pressure on hospitals. So because of all these measures that have been taken, we haven't experienced a surge and we haven't experienced the struggles that some of the other hospitals in other nations have faced, which is a great position to be in. So I think um, it's one of the rare times where our country has come together, put politics aside, um, and the community has banded together and just done what's right. And I think that's what Australia has always done. So I think we're in a great position. Totally. And you touched on an important point here. You know, it we as health professionals can do so much but if the authorities don't make the right choices and put proper restrictions and um, i don't like to use a word enforcement but in a way you know what i'm talking about uh pro proper um, laws in place 
to protect a wider community, there's only little we can do because we can continue to campaign, but when it becomes, um, when it comes from the government, there's no ambiguity. This is how yeah. it is, this is the rules, this is the right advice, this is what the citizen should follow. And that comes out much better than any campaigns that you and I would individually do. So I think, you know, I'm really proud of Australia. Initially, I was concerned, but I'm really proud of Australia. We have kept that and the authorities have done a great job. Yeah, and we've all done it together. Whereas you see in some of the other nations that there's disagreement and there's fracturing between the governments and doctors and the community. And I think um, just the way we've gone about it is so good and it's heartening. Yes, absolutely. Um, you particularly, uh, then I, when I was looking through and everything, I was very, um, I wanted to know more about uh, the risk in uh, people with disability. That's something yeah. that um, has not been um, discussed or brought into uh, attention much because we are all in a rush to make sure the, the major part is looked at, but it is now important yeah. to discuss and be more aware. So please let me tell me and um, talk to me about what is your understanding about um, COVID and risk for physically challenged uh, people? Yeah, look, um, I'll just start it with me as an example. I have a spinal cord injury, which, uh, and the level of my spinal cord injury has meant that my lungs are really affected. So my lung function is very different to um, someone without a spinal cord injury. So even things like the flu can kill someone with a spinal cord injury very quickly. And respiratory complications are one of the leading causes of death for someone with um, an injury like this. But it's not just spinal cord injury. Um, any neuromuscular condition or any chronic lung condition or any, um, there, there's a whole range of disabilities that can compromise your lung function and immune system as well. And all these people, including me, are at a greater, greater risk of a poorer outcome from COVID-19. Um, so if, you know, the, the statistics for anyone ending up in the ICU is already pretty poor when you have COVID-19. I think some of the data that's coming out suggests that the mortality rates are approaching 50% or more. So that's, that's pretty bad. But when you add a complex medical condition like this into it, that can get much worse. So certainly um, people with disabilities or certain types of disabilities are at much more risk of dying from this and having complications. The other concern, um, the more ethical concern that's been coming out of all this is the, um, particularly in the US, there were some reports made to human rights officers there about rationing and that specifically pertains to ventilators so if there's a limited number of ventilators which there are there's only a finite amount of ventilators um, and you have more patients than there are ventilators how do you ration that and um, if you have someone say like me with a spinal cord injury and someone similar to me without a spinal cord injury Arguably, the person without a spinal cord injury is going to have a better chance of surviving if you put them on a ventilator. Wow. So one of the exactly. So one of the ethical arguments is: should you give a ventilator to the person that has a better chance of surviving, or not? So these are you know, there's no right answer to these questions, but, that, um, but they're very. That is unfair. That is not how we practice medicine, is it? Like you and I know, we can't treat like that. We can't treat a patient like that. We can't pick and choose. Exactly. But when, you, when you're at a point where you have limited resources and when you have to choose who to give those resources to, the, those are the difficult ethical considerations that some of our colleagues have been facing overseas um, when they have had limited amount of ventilators. And... Um, these are really tricky conversations and they're, they're 
but they're things that we need to have some discourse about. There are things that we need to decide how to approach. Um, and they're just, you know, they're uncomfortable conversations and they're politically complex conversations, but they're definitely things that we do need to think about. Fortunately, we're at a point where we don't have to worry about these problems in Australia because our resources are meeting the demand. But what, what, what if we ever got to a point where the resources are stretched? Um, those are things that we do need to think about and those are things that we need to have a clear answer to. Yeah. But the rights of, um, certainly the rights of people with disabilities can be um, impinged upon in these situations. There's plenty of literature out there that suggests that um, healthcare providers make judgments um, which are unfounded about the quality of life in people with disabilities. And they can use those judgments to guide treatment. So we, we just need to make sure that none of that sort of thing happens, but resources are allocated in a fair and just way yeah. when, uh, when resources become stretched. It's a very sensitive, but a very important subject, which uh, yeah. it needs to be discussed. You know, yes, fingers crossed, we will escape. And hopefully we wouldn't have a bad second or third wave as we with the numbers that we have right now. Uh, but these are important uh, things that we need to look at because we need to be prepared for tomorrow as well. Uh, in case, I mean, we can't foolproof. COVID has taught us that. So in case something like this happened, we need to have our internal, internal resources and make sure we take the right decision and be fair with uh, everybody. But it leads to something that's very sensitive. You know, you're a doctor, you're on the front line, and you have pointed out the very fact that you have got the spinal injury and um, your lungs uh, could be affected more than others. Are you not scared to be in front line? I'm asking as well. Oh. Well, I actually wanted to stay um, in the emergency department, but they moved us um, away from the ED. Um, me and some of my colleagues who have uh, different medical conditions affecting the lung function. So at the moment, I'm actually working with our executive director or deputy executive director of medical services um, in uh, helping out with junior doctors and things like that. Um, but I, I would, I mean, I understand the risks and uh, I trained to be a doctor, so I, I don't really want to step out at a time when we're needed the most. Um, it's kind of like signing up for the army and not wanting to fight, one of my friends said. Yeah. So. yeah, that's exactly right. You know, that's the passion. That is why we have trained as medical professional. And this is the time our people need us. It's not when they are well, when they are sick. And just because they have got COVID or they may have COVID, that shouldn't and wouldn't change an, even a single bit of what we do. That makes us feel that we are here, we have the purpose for what we have done. Yeah, it's amazing exactly. how people like yourself and, and so many other colleagues around the world, they have sacrificed, you know, and even put themselves at risk. You know, we have unfortunately lost some of our colleagues, but. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, yeah, it is a reality. It's like uh, being at a war zone. I know. And I, I, again, I think we're so lucky in Australia, but um, it's not the case in the NHS or New York. We hear reports from our colleagues and it's just harrowing. It breaks my heart because I moved from England and I, moved, I was in Guys and St. Thomas's London. It really breaks my heart. And I, you know, I try, you know, uh, to not take on the negative thoughts as well, because that's something that it's a very important subject. We as a medical professional, even we go through a lot of emotions. We go through a lot of stress and anxiety. Uh, we don't know what's coming and we worry about what's going on all around the world. So it's hard even as medical professional to deal with our own mental uh, challenges and uh, mental health problems and the anxiety of it all. I wonder what it is like being a physical, um, you know, for a normal uh, physically challenged person sitting at home who have got no medical background. How are they going to cope? What are the 
what is there in place? How can we help? How can we reach out? Well, this uh, that's a really good question. And at the start of the pandemic, I had a lot of discussions with different people that have a spinal cord injury or whatever it may be. Um, and some, some people chose to isolate themselves really early um, and they just lock themselves away for weeks. And um, that's complex though, because uh, you know, a, lot of the, a lot of these people need assistance with their day-to-day -day lives. So they have other people in their lives that need to come in. So some, some people isolated themselves with their, with their um, assistance and whatever else. Um, so it, it's not a straightforward thing that they can do, especially when they need some, some of these guys need 24 hour um, care with stuff. So it, it's not the most straightforward thing. And um, obviously the fear, you know, especially when we start to have discussions about healthcare rationing and ventilators and the complications that can happen. Um, it's uh, the, there's a lot of fear and anxiety, but I think, that's affecting a lot of people at the moment. All these, um, there's going to be an increase, or we're already seeing an increase in the mental health issues. We're seeing worsening of existing mental health issues, and I think we're we're all feeling a bit on the edge. And two, so, yeah, the suicide thoughts is on the rise. Exactly. So. You know, that, that's, that's uh, um, I was actually just having a f chat with a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist and she was saying that they're starting to see more and more uh, cases of uh, suicide attempts and whatever it may be. The social implications are also very, very high, uh, particularly for people with disability because, you know, they're, they're from a... a medical and social perspective there there's already a disparity and there's already gaps that they face with uh, employment education incomes whatever else so in these situations all that is amplified uh, and they become more isolated lose incomes and again we're seeing that across the board uh yesterday i was having a chat with um uh, dean of medical school who was saying that there are medical students that have lost their part-time jobs and things and now they're struggling to feed themselves and pay the rent. So it affects a wide cross-section of our society. But I think the most important part is for us to help each other. Um, we've seen leaders of big private companies stepping up and cutting down their salaries so they could keep their staff afloat. We've seen um, people just supporting each other's neighbours, work colleagues, whatever else. So this is just one of those times where we need to step up, look after each other and get each other through this time. It's, it's, it's unprecedented as they call it and which is, it's so, uh, um, I never thought something like this uh, I'd be facing in my life. It's, I'm sure for everybody is the same. Um, is say what is your message uh, for those people who are physically physically challenged or differently abled who would be watching um, yeah. watching us talk right now? How do how what are your tips? How do you cope? And what are the help available that they can take advantage? Um. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because after I had the accident myself, people are asking me how I cope and I think you just have to. You either curl up and die or keep going. So that's not a very satisfying answer, but um, I think you just have to keep going. There, there will be an end to this. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It's just getting through the thick of it. Um, that's the hard part. But we'll get through it. And in Australia, we're super lucky. We're getting through it much quicker than anywhere else. And uh, once we get through it, the world will go back to normal. It might take a little bit of time, but it will go back to normal. I think um, there's plenty of resources. Again, we're so lucky in Australia, but the NDIS um, has stepped in and they've done a lot of good stuff. So there are support services that you can access. 
even the supermarkets have created uh, specific shopping times. So there, there are a lot of resources that you can access to make life a little bit easier. But I think also just try to tap into your support networks, reach out to people. There are a lot of people that want to help, whether it be online or not. But um, more than anything, I think during this time, social connection is the most important thing. We just need to come together as a society and support each other. So whether you're differently abled or not, reach out, see what you can do for someone. Um, and by helping each other, I think we can really get through this. Yes, we will. Thank you so much. And you're quite right. I think what, from what you're saying, the most important message I got was seek help. Do not hesitate. Ask for help. And the help is out there. And we should not forget that. Anyway, really enjoy talking to you. I could go on talking to you forever. You're such a lovely man. I met you outside um, before the COVID times and um, hopefully we'll meet again in person <laughs> without all the social distancing. And uh, yeah, thank you. Keep up all your good work. I'm signing off. Bye-bye. Yeah, likewise. Take care. Thank you. Take care too. <laughs>